I don't know if there's a higher calling on the face of this earth than to be a mother. I don't know any vocation or calling that someone would need more gifts, talents, abilities than to be a mother. But every Mother's Day, as we worship together, I always say, Lord, give me an insight. Give me something fresh to say, challenging to say about motherhood in the 21st century. And sometimes from the pew, there comes amazing stories that remind all of us of the various, various kinds of callings that individuals have who become mothers. This film will introduce, I think, a family to us that most of us already know that will give a clear witness as to the sacredness of being a mom. We're at the Tarrant County Junior Livestock Show, and our group of kids have steers. My name's Kyle Polson, 48 years old. Lived in Houston till the early 80s and moved uh, out to Belleville, Texas, just a little bit west of Houston. Fort Worth was a really good fit for me, and I decided to stay in Fort Worth and had a job opportunity, so I've been in Fort Worth since 1990. It was important for me to get Jackson involved. We live in West Fort Worth, a little bit of a bubble. It's exposing him to kind of a, more of a real world, and uh, it is like a job. He's getting up at six o'clock and doing stuff that other kids are maybe on their Xbox and playing Fortnite or something, and he's shoveling manure and kind of getting drug around a little bit. Kyle is just the most selfless person I've ever met. He puts everyone before him. Um, he'd give you the shirt off the back, and I know you hear that a lot, but that is a really true statement. I think that if there are one or two things that most people in Fort Worth know Kyle for, it is his amazing devotion to his children. My dad is one of the most fun people in the entire world. He always pushes me to do my best, always finding more opportunities for me to be better. My parents were uh, great faith and uh, big believers, and they instilled that in my sister and I at an early age. I bet when I was eight or nine, I knew I was adopted or kind of understood the concept of being adopted. I never felt like it was, I was different. I actually kind of felt special. This family took me, they wanted me. I really believe that um, when I was adopted, God put me with the perfect family. Maybe everyone thinks they've got the perfect family, but I really believe it. My dad was unbelievable, great man, morals and ethics, and just taught me kind of what, I mean, he's my hero. He was and always will be. And my mom was just always there, our sporting events, we were at church every Sunday, home cooked meals, you just kind of think it's the cleavers. My dad passed away in 1995, which was really tough on me. That was a year after, one year after uh, I got out of school. My mom was a diabetic and uh, had a lot of health problems. So I had the unbelievable parents, unbelievable childhood. But when she passed away in November of 16, she had always encouraged me to try to go find my birth mother. So I started um, in probably February of 2017, and I contacted DePelchin, is where I was adopted. I had to fill out several questionnaires, and they'd pull some records, and uh, kind of in a quick way, they just said, listen, we're, this is a closed file. Uh, we're sorry, uh, we like to help you, but we can't, we protect the birth mothers. So, right, you gotta respect that. She said, but if you want to, you can contact the court system. That's the next step in Texas, that's your last step. And so at that point, I was literally thought this was it. And then I just happened to look at the judge's name, contacted my wife's godmother, and she, was, she worked for uh, Judge Ted Poe, knew a lot of the judges in Houston. I said, hey, do you happen to know this judge? She goes, I do know the judge. I know his cousin, and let me make some calls. This is about eight o'clock. Well, she texts someone and they call, and 
she called back with great news and said, judge is gonna open your file. So at that point, I was thinking, you know, I've got, still got a chance. My son goes to school with a kid and his mother's a private investigator. I said, hey, can we go to lunch? I'd like to visit with you. I'm trying to track down my birth mother and here's these records I've found. This is the Depelchin records, which are all whited out. Here's the court records, which I'm kind of at a dead end. And I said, is there anything you can do? And she kind of smiled and said, yeah, I can, I'll work on this. And literally in a couple hours, October 30th at 5.03, she calls me and says, Nina Hindi's your mother. I'm Nina Hindi, and I'm married to Ed, and we own the Taste of Texas restaurant. We've been open 42 years, love what we do. We have three children and 11 grandchildren. When I was 17 years old, I surrendered a child to adoption. Very young, uh, afraid, uh, but knew from the very start uh, what my choice would be, and that choice was life. And on June the 2nd, I delivered a beautiful baby boy. And the process was harsh then uh, because it it was very closed. Uh, we're, I was not allowed to know anything. The only thing I had was the ability to pray. And I was just like, wow, this emotion. I know who it is. She's alive. I immediately got online. And, and, and once you have someone's name, there's, you can find a lot of stuff, especially someone like, like Nina, who's just a great person doing so much for the community that you could just see this unbelievable person, this great life she's got. She had this unbelievable husband. She's got this great family. She's in Houston, just being an awesome person. And so the emotion on October 30th going forward was just unbelievable. I, I met my precious husband and on our second date, I realized he was an amazing guy. And so we went to dinner and um, we sat at the table and I said, okay, this might be the deal breaker, but I want you to know who I am. And I just struck me, it just, I stopped in my tracks and took a deep breath and I said, there is a woman of moral conviction, of incredible character and strength and courage and self-reliance that she would act on, not out of convenience, she would act on, on this and take the tougher road and give this child a chance at life and then say, this is part of my life because I made that. And I thought, that is the woman I want to be married to. I was assuming and guessed that I was probably some secret. No one knew about me. And so how could I reach out to her without upsetting her life? I didn't want to be the grenade that comes in at age 48. Um, and destroy her life or, or do anything to, to harm her. So for the next couple months, I start writing a letter. I think the letter had a full 25 drafts. He really knew he had one chance to get it right, to present it correctly to her, to make her feel comfortable. I walked into the kitchen and Ed had gotten the mail and there was a letter on the top of the mail that said personal and confidential. And I opened the letter and it said, my name is Kyle Polson, and I believe you're my birth mother. Oh, my goodness. I get a telephone call, and I've got her number saved, and it's Nina. My heart's about coming out of my chest, and she said, I've been looking for you for 48 years. And I'm just very emotional talking to your mother for the first time at age 48, but it was a... Uh, it was unbelievable. We kind of talked about a plan and we started texting from that day forward. And I'm, then I start thinking, where are we gonna have this reunion? This is where we had our first reunion. Ed dropped her off. She was kind of sending me text. I'm getting close, here I am. She's here, she says, I'm here, I'm coming up the elevator. And then she came off the elevator. I was sitting right here looking at the elevators and she rounded the corner and the, the whole emotion of, uh, Seeing your mom for the first time in person was uh, was pretty amazing. It was like 
like he'd always been there. It was as natural and normal and to get to tell him the things that I had prayed for him for his entire life. I don't know how you can feel love so quick. You shouldn't have to say it, but you feel the love, it's, it's real. And both of them have just been all in and you're part of the family, this is, this is what we're doing. And you'd think that would take some time and it's instant. Kyle grew up right here. All along, God had him in my heart, but he also had him right here. So Kyle went to beach retreat at Second Baptist Church. Oddly enough, in middle school, I would go to the Second Baptist Beach retreat, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And it was a very spiritual thing. We'd go on the beach uh, and have this quiet time and pray. And Dr. Young said, I want you to ask God to be your savior. That was the time I really put it on the table and asked and had that feeling of, man, I'm, he's with me. God's behind me and he's guiding my ship. Every time I would think about him, I would pray. God, if it's ever your will for us to reunite, God, let that be, please. That is the desire of my heart. And you know, he tells us, I will give you the desires of your heart. Dear Mrs. Hindy, please know that I realize from the very bottom of my heart, what a shock this letter must be. Please know that I have spent years considering the best way to reach out to you and deliver this letter fully understanding the significance and the impact on both of our lives. I originally started writing this note on June 2nd, my 48th birthday, as I reflected on the extraordinary gift you gave me. I am certain adoption was a painful decision, but I want you to know everything worked out exactly as God planned. You made the ultimate selfless decision and you gave me the chance for an amazing life. My parents, Mary Jo and Knut Polson, were simply exceptional. They were incredible and nurturing and the most loving parents I have ever witnessed. What a blessing that they were mine. I have no doubt I am the most fortunate adopted person ever and cannot imagine anyone having had a better childhood than me. They were devoted Christians and the faith that they taught me helped me form the family that we are and it got us through the highs and lows of life. Unfortunately, they are both gone now and have been reunited with each other with Christ in heaven. She and my dad live their life entirely, completely in love with each other, with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On my birthday, every year my mom would cry and tell me one of her greatest wishes was the, for the selfless woman who gave birth to me to see how I turned out. have known about Kyle for 45 years, have loved Nina for 45 years, and met Kyle months ago, and I'm still tearing up just watching this. So if you've got a handkerchief handy, there's nothing wrong with you. In fact, if this doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. It is my honor and pleasure for you to meet and hear from my precious wife, Nina, and our son, Kyle, who's here with his Fort Worth family. Please come up. You have an extra handkerchief for me? <laughs> Happy Mother's Day weekend. There are no words that I can say that adequately describe my feelings right now, but here are a few as I try my best. The first word is awe. I am in complete awe of God's grace. I would never have dreamed of a world where I would one day not only find my birth mom, the amazing Nina Hindi, but find such love and acceptance and family immediately. Although we were only reunited 135 days ago, I'm convinced she has walked beside, my, beside me my entire life. We have a lot in common. 
my friends and family would, would be the first to tell you that I, I too can't sit still. The to-do to -do list are long. If you're going to do something right, if you're going to do something, do it right. Go big or go home. And lazy is not in the playbook. They would also tell you that family and faith comes first for me always. They would probably tell you that I have a deep appreciation for Texas history, the come and take it flag, our amazing military and servicemen, the gift of living in the best state in the best country in the world. You might say there is no question I'm definitely Nina's child. I am awed by her and Ed and their faith, their love for each other and their love for family and their love for their friends. I am in awe of Nina Hindi for her courage in stepping out so boldly to tell her story, our story, as one of life, joy, and restoration. I am truly filled with awe that God has brought us together today here in this church as we tell that story. I'm in awe of the inexplicable number of connections between my, my life and Nina's over the last 48 years. My godparents and closest family friends have been members of Second Baptist since 1979, and I was here several times with them as a kid. I went to beach retreat in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. When we lived in Houston, we lived in Briargrove Park. I lived less than one mile from the Taste of Texas. My family had dinner several times at Nina's restaurant. Ed and my godfather were men's prayer team members for 25 years. My sweet mom had an incredible group of friends, many here today that also knew Nina through Second Baptist Bible Studies and other charity work. In fact, one of those mutual friends who's been Nina's Bible study for 25 years actually went with my mom to Alabama in the early 90s as my mom searched for her own birth mother as she too was adopted. I grew up working in my dad's sale barn near Belleville where Ed Nina once came to a sale. I have no doubt I was working cattle in the back that same day. We recently, uh, we realized recently Nina's neighbor's mom and my mom were neighbors and friends at the Belmont Village just across the street. Recently Nina's neighbor saw a picture of me and asked, why do you have a picture of Kyle Polson? Nina replied, well that's my son. Aaron and I are are also so grateful for our many friends in Fort Worth. To make a small world even smaller, some of our closest friends there have actually known Ed and Nina for almost 20 years. I've coached your boys in baseball and football, and we raise, raise our show steers together. You can't make this up. I'm in awe of our God that weaves together the fabric of so many lives in ways we will never understand, but know his hand is in all of this. There is really no other explanation. The second word that best describes this day for me is grateful. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. I sincerely believe I had the greatest mom and dad, Mary Jo and Knute Polson, for whom I am ever grateful. Many of you here today and watching live had the blessing to know them, and to know them was a gift. They were joyful, kind, down-to-earth people. They taught me and my wonderful sister Kirsten that faith, family and friends were truly life's greatest joys. And what a joyful life, first Nina, then my parents have given to me. I'm a lucky man, I got to spend 44 Mother's Days with my mom before she left us on November 11th, 2016. She was kind and loving and so beautiful and truly lit up every room she ever walked into. I have no doubt heaven is shining even brighter than normal right now as she and my dad smiled down on us today. I am grateful for my wife, Erin, and my kids, Grayson and Jackson, all here today. Erin has dedicated her life to our family, believing there is no greater calling than that. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, and thank you, Grayson and Jackson, for being here today and for giving me the best reason to wake up every day. Happy Mother's Day, Erin. I am grateful for Nina and Ed, grateful to see how they live their lives, their positive impact on their friends and this community, it's, it's inspiring. It makes me want to be better and do more for others. Nina and I have loved and laughed a lot over the last couple of months, both probably relieved to find that neither one of us is living under a bridge. 
Nina, what a gift to celebrate our first Mother's Day together. There are no words to express how grateful I am to know that this will be the first of many, many more to come. I'm grateful for my sister Kirsten, Lisa, Kristen, Claudine, and their families for their support and being part of this journey. I didn't have the privilege of knowing Ed K, but he, he's here with us today, and I know he's proud of his mom. And finally, the third word that comes to mind is excited. I'm excited. Excited most for what God has in store for all of us as we navigate this, this next part of our lives together. To meet and know Nina, to begin to understand her story and the extraordinary courage and her choice for life she made almost 49 years ago. And again, the extraordinary courage in her sharing her journey today is a story that will ring true and hopefully inspire and bless others far into the future. When Aaron left the letter in Nina's mailbox just a few short months ago, I would have never guessed that we'd be standing together here at Second Baptist on Mother's Day telling our story to the world. I had to be prepared that we may only meet once. I could tell her thank you for choosing life and then we would both go back to our lives with no one knowing, no, knowing anything more. I hoped and prayed for more, but knew the odds were small. Wow, how wrong I was. I obviously didn't know Nina Hindi then, but I would soon find out. And how grateful and excited and in awe I am of this incredible journey that God has blessed us with. Today marks a, a new and beautiful day in a new and beautiful chapter, and God be all the glory. Thank you, Dr. Young, for letting us share our special story today. Happy Mother's Day. I brought my Kleenex. Church family, it is good to be back in the house of the Lord. Oh my goodness. We have so missed you. We've been members of Second Baptist for 28 years, and this church home has been a huge part of our lives. You have poured out overwhelming love to us um, in, in many, many ways for many years. And I love the way you have poured out to us for this reunion story. Many of you have reached out in encouragement, and thank you for that. And I am so blessed by you. And my life is blessed. One of my greatest blessings is my husband, Ed, who absolutely adores me in every way. And he's just incredible. He's very intentional in his love for me and for our family, and that is such a gift as a wife and as mother. We've been married for 45 years, and we have four amazing kids and 11 grandchildren. We opened our Taste of Texas restaurant 42 years ago, and our family was literally raised in the Taste of Texas, in the building, kind of like the family farm. Um, when our three-year-old daughter would get out of preschool, she would spend her days at the restaurant, and she spent her days with her bartender, we're in the restaurant business. Her name was Linda and she loved our daughter. And so when we made our very first visit to a Baptist church, we picked up the three-year-old from Sunday school and the teacher was standing at the door and she looked at Ed and said, what do you all do? And Ed said, well, we're in the restaurant business. And the lady said, oh, that makes sense. Your three-year-old made margaritas for the entire three-year-old Sunday school class. <laughs> At that point, we moved the three-year-old upstairs to the administrator. Now we have our third generation of Hindis working at the Taste of Texas. But tonight I wanna to tell you about three moms that have made an incredible impact in my life. First was my own mom, Jean Johnson. She was orphaned at age eight during the Great Depression, and she grew up at the Fowler Orphanage in Dallas, Texas, never adopted. She, was, uh, she claimed she was five feet tall. No, she was not. 
She was four foot ten at best, but she was powerful in her life, in her faith, in her love, and in her, in her strength of conviction. Do not ever try to change her mind. I talked back to my mom once, once. She would call me every morning and ask, how can I pray for you today? Today, I use that with my own family. She was a woman of strength, and she is with me today. The next mom is my mother-in-law, Ann Hindi. She loved me so unconditionally, and she was truly one of my best friends. Ann was always willing to help me with any project that I had going like deep cleaning the restaurant on a Saturday morning or decorating for Christmas or teaching me how to put up peach preserves or pickles. She too had grown up in the depression and relationships were everything to her. She loved her family and was patient and loving with every single one of us, including Ed's dad, Al Hindi, uh, and who, he was a real character. They would come to visit uh, Second Baptist with us, and one Sunday, to our surprise, Al Hindi answered the invitation, got up out of his seat, and walked the aisle. And the very next Sunday, he rose from his seat again and walked the aisle again. And Ed told him after counseling, Dad, you only have to do that once. And Al replied, I know I just had another great off-color joke to tell Dr. Young because no one ever tells the pastor the good jokes. (laughs) I grew up in Dallas in a wonderful yet very imperfect family. My parents knew and loved the Lord and they were prayer warriors. I was active in my church and I loved my youth group. Just after Christmas, my junior year, while in a relationship with my high school sweetheart, I realized I was pregnant. Oh, my. Absolutely not acceptable for this 17-year-old daughter of a fairly prominent family to be pregnant at that time in our society. I was standing under the pecan tree outside of our front door of our home when I made a decision that would impact my life in ways I could never even imagine. I was going to have this baby. The alternative was not acceptable. After explaining the situation to my family and my decision, my mother replied that God would honor this decision not to turn my mistake into a tragedy. So I moved to Houston to live with my amazing brother, Dan, and his brand new wife, Joycelyn. Dan was a senior at Rice University and brand newly married. And so here comes his pregnant younger sister to live with them and attend school at the Florence Crittenton Home for Unwed Mothers. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And it has always been my life verse. I was born with a lot of energy, and being still has never been easy for me. But from January to June of 1971, I had a lot of time to be still. My Crittenden classes contained counseling on what adoption meant for me going forward, including those sealed court records forever and how detrimental it would be to my child if I ever attempted to find or contact him. Crittenton was a Christian organization, and my favorite counselor told me as I sat in her office and sobbed one day to pray without ceasing. If it was God's will for me to know my child, no court would ever stop it. She affirmed over and over again that God would bless my decision to choose life, and I should never stop praying for my baby. And so I prayed for 48 years. I prayed first for him to be healthy, both 
physically and spiritually. I prayed for him to know the love of the Lord and for him to find joy in his life. I prayed for God to choose an adoptive family that would love him the way he deserved to be loved. I prayed for his wife from the day he was born and for his children, should he ever have children. I prayed for him to know how much I loved him and for one day for us to be reunited. I prayed for him not to live under a bridge. On the morning of June the 2nd, 1971, at Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston, Texas, I gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. Seven pounds, one ounce, 20 and a half inches long. My prayer number one was answered. Adoption rules were very strict and I had been told I would not be allowed to see him or ever to hold him. But God sent a compassionate nurse who placed him in my arms, smiled at me, winked at me, and said she was needed at the desk. I got to hold my baby for 20 precious minutes to share with him my love, my prayers, my hopes, and my dreams for his life. I have probably thanked God for her compassion a thousand times. When she returned and took him from my arms, I told my precious baby goodbye, not knowing if I would ever see him again. And with strength that comes only from the Lord, I surrendered him with perfect peace, knowing that God is in control was in control, and believing that God would give him a life that I could not give him. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. I never regretted the hardest decision of my life because it really defined my life. It caused me to treasure every moment with my children, and it made me a much better mom. I have never taken my children's abundant love for me for granted. Proverbs 31 says, her children will arise and call her blessed. First John 3, 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. We lost our son, Ed, 10 years ago in a skiing accident. And God continues to heal our family and richly bless us all. The power of prayer is truly phenomenal. A few years ago, Dr. Young preached a sermon about being disciplined in our prayer life. And I decided to try to put it in practice. I pray in order, which makes sense to all of you left brain people who have a system for everything. I start with praise for what the Lord has done, thanking him for his incredible blessings. I ask God to search me, to know me, and to find any unclean way in me. I pray for our children in order. I thank God for my husband and his love for me. I pray for the grandchildren. I pray for the baby that I surrendered 48 years ago. God, if it is your will, let us be reunited. This past Thanksgiving, we had a joyous family time, and I felt my spirit quickening, anticipating a blessing. I thought it was the Christmas decorations at the Taste of Texas. I was anticipating with joy But God was preparing me for an incredible gift, an incredible blessing. The next week as I prayed, the baby kept coming to mind over and over. So I'd pray, and out of the blue, the baby would come to mind again. As 
I prayed. Um, one morning on my way to work, I called my brother that I'd lived with 48 years before. I called my brother and I said, thank you. Thank you for what you did for me 48 years ago. Just out of the blue. The following week, on December the 16th, at 7.10 in the morning, I walked into my kitchen, and there was a letter marked personal and confidential. And I opened the letter, and it said, Dear Mrs. Hindy, my name is Kyle Polson, and I believe you're my birth mother. I told you there were three mothers that have made a tremendous impact in my life. My mom, Ed's mom, and it turns out with God's great faithfulness, Kyle's mom, Mary Jo Polson. Wow, she was a phenomenal woman. I have been blessed by her precious friends reaching out to me to tell me Mary Jo's stories. She had an amazing faith and was involved with community Bible study. She was stunningly beautiful both inside and out, incredibly loving, gracious, kind, and hilarious. She brought joy wherever she went, and she was a Adored by her family and friends. She served her community tirelessly. And she raised an amazing daughter, Kirsten, and son, Kyle. I never met her, but I would have loved to have had the opportunity to thank her for all she did. God answered my prayers through Mary Jo and Canute as they provided for Kyle the love, the family, and the life that I had prayed for him so earnestly for so many years. In the last years of her life, she encouraged Kyle to go and find his birth mother so she could see what kind of a man he grew to be. Even in her absence, she blesses me daily. And now I can see clearly how God was moving to answer all of those prayers. Kyle was raised a mile from the taste of Texas, attended Second Baptist Beach Retreat, accepted Christ there, attended St. Francis Episcopal School, playing on sports teams with close friends of ours, countless intertwined family and friends that are unbelievable blessings in our life. God is so good. There are many, many miracles in the midst of our reunion story, and God continues to remind us that he is the center of all of this. Even today, as we are here socially distanced and trying to figure out what life is going to look like, we're not all that different from the scared 17-year-old 48 years ago. It's almost unbelievable and seemingly impossible, but nothing is impossible with God. I could have never imagined how this would turn out, but I do know one thing. God is enough for all of our needs. He loves me and he loves you. He forgives me and he forgives you. He delights in restoring us and answering our prayers and showing us the intricacies of life. God is in the restoration business. When we pray in earnest, we can't see God's timetable. We must trust in his goodness and believe that his will is perfect. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, Nina Johnson Hindi, Kyle Knute Polson, Second Baptist family, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Happy Mother's Day.
we be seated for a moment? When someone shares their life, they allow us to walk on holy ground. We'll never forget this Mother's Day because Nina has enabled us to walk on holy ground. When Nina was 17, she made a poor choice. But when Nina was 17, she didn't compound that choice by making a second poor choice. She chose life. And therefore, we've shared in this wonderful story of reunion and reconciliation. Some here, when we were young or you were a teenager, you made a poor choice. And maybe you compounded by that poor choice by making a second poor choice. You did not choose life. But I could say that God's grace is all sufficient. We make a poor choice, then we make a good choice, or we make a poor choice, and we make another poor choice. There will be for those who made that poor choice a great reconciliation in heaven with that child that never lived in this world. That is the grace of God. He brings it all together. And that's the miracle of love that we've seen in this life. And we'll see that same miracle in heaven time and time and time again. 